yeah, it wasn't until um, the doctor had come in to tell me, uh, you know, you have a large mass in your chest. We're pretty sure it's cancer. It's not a chore or anything like that. You know, being a dad is something that's very special for me. I thought about my kids, right? So when when cancer sometimes runs in your family, you, the mindset comes, is this something that I can pass on to my kids? You know, later on, as I'm starting to additionally digest some of the information, it's, well, how did I get lung cancer? I like to have a great time. I try to see positive in things even before a cancer diagnosis. Um, you know, I, I try and get along with a lot of people and I you know, really have want to have positive interactions with people that I come across, um, whether it's just meeting them for the first time or just saying hi to someone. Um, very loving and outgoing. Awesome. And I understand so you have a wife and is it two daughters? Two daughters, yep. Well, we'll talk, of course, more about the both of them. I know they're a big part of your story. Um, can you, I know it was 20, was it 2019 or so? Something wasn't feeling right. Can you introduce us to what happened and what got you into the healthcare system? Sure. So uh, I, I had started uh, with cold symptoms um, November, about mid-November of 2018. And then the cold just wouldn't go away. And it just continued to progress into um, shortness of breath, a little bit of tightness in the chest, lost my voice, um, going to my primary care physician and, you know, just being pumped with steroids or inhalers and, and nothing seemed to work at any point. Um, you know, and no additional tests were ordered. Uh, it was all the way until the uh, very end of January that I was, uh, chasing my youngest across the dance studio. And um, I was out of breath within steps. And I had already exhibited symptoms of being out of breath, easily doing other things. Um, but I was always resilient to push through. Uh, um, I had a telemedicine appointment. And then at that point, at the telemedicine appointment, the doctor said, you know, you could have had a minor heart attack. At, at some point, we need you to go to the ER. So went to the ER and a number of tests were done. It wasn't until a CT scan was performed that they had noticed or come across um, a large mass in my chest, so. Do you, I'm, I'm sure uh, you remember, cause it's so vivid for so many of us, just the moment when you realized, oh, this isn't, this isn't some extended cold or pneumonia or anything like this. This is something much more serious. Yeah, it wasn't until um, the doctor had come in to tell me, um, you know, you have a large mass in your chest. We're pretty sure it's cancer and we think it's lymphoma. My, my uncle had passed away uh, from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma um, just after six months of being diagnosed um, back in uh, the mid 2000s. And um, that was the first thought that ran through my head is what his kids went through. Um, not necessarily him, but what his family went through because of the diagnosis. So, um, it struck home for me right away. And I knew, you know, it was serious at that point. I mean, given that kind of information and context for you, I can't even imagine. So it was serious for you from the get-go because you had this personal sort of firsthand knowledge. Um, when was it, well, first of all, was your wife with you when you heard the news? Can you recount what was going on for both of you? So I didn't go to the hospital until about 
10 o'clock at night, 10, 10 30 at night. So it wasn't until two, three o'clock in the morning that the doctor had actually come back into the room in the ER. So I was by myself, not thinking that anything was going on. Um, you know, wasn't really scared going to the hospital in any way. Um, but, um, you know, my wife stayed home with my, with our girls because obviously they couldn't stay at home alone. So at that point I had called my wife and, um, we had a family member come over and watch the kids. Um, and then my wife rushed over as soon as she could. I mean, I'm sure you remember when she came into the hospital room, what that was like. Could you describe what, what that was like for, for the both of you? Um, it's kind of a blur, to be honest. Um, there's so many vivid memories. Um, just from a lot of the events that had taken place. Uh, and your life is a whirlwind, as you know, when you're first diagnosed or when you're going through some of those traumatic experiences um, that you don't remember everything. Some things stick out more than others, but I remember placing the call, right? And I remember the doctor coming in and sitting on the bed and, and saying that to me. Um, no, I, I completely understand that it's a blur thing. Like some things are very vivid. Some things are like, I don't know what happened or what you said. Were you there? Um, exactly. You did talk about thinking about your uncle in this time. And so translating it to your experience, I'm imagining your first thought was about your two daughters. Um, can you describe what you were thinking and feeling about them when you found out you had, a, you know, you had cancer? Yeah, so children's innocence was so prevalent in my mind at that point. Um, the thought that, you know, they just don't, they don't know what cancer is, what it means. Um, and all they, if they had to put their mind around something, it's just probably going to be death associated with cancer. Um, and the thought that my kids would grow up without a dad or without that influence in their life, um, it was really hurtful to me. Um, not that I ever took life for granted, but, you know, things really get real and put into perspective when, you know, someone throws around a cancer diagnosis. Dan, how much uh, longer, so you learned later that it was lung cancer. Was it immediately, it was stage four, you were told? Yeah, so in the matter of, from the day that I went into the hospital, uh, I would say, 10 or 11 days later is when we had realized that it was uh, non-small cell lung cancer. And at that point it was at least stage three and they were going to do some staging. So in the coming week or two, there were a number of different staging tests that I had gone through and biopsies and whatnot to, to determine, you know, stage three or stage four at that point. Can you um, describe the, was it a call? Was it an in-person appointment when you yeah. learned that it was, so it was a snowy Tuesday. My wife was home from school uh, as a school teacher. I was working from home and we had received a phone call from um, the oncologist, lymphoma oncologist, and um, as well as the interventional pulmonologist who had, who had done the, the bronchoscopy to get the sample. And, um, you know, they had given us... Um, you know, three kind of ideas of what it could have been. So sarcoidosis, lymphoma, and lung cancer. So really we're not expecting lung cancer, but here it is, right? So we're gonna tell you it could be lung cancer. And, um, but we really don't think it's that. So when uh, that Tuesday afternoon came and they called, uh, they asked us to write some things down. And, uh, you know, like I said, thankfully my wife was home. So they gave us the news that it was lung cancer at that point, um, at least stage three, but I, all, but I had a biomarker, a driver behind my cancer that was uh, out positive. We had no idea what that meant. Um, you know, I'm in a, in a career that's not medically related in any way. And, um, my wife being a teacher, you know, we're street smart at that point, a little bit of books, 
she's much more book smart than I am, but you know, it immediately went to survival mode, right? So let's start looking up what this means. Let's see, you know, who the proper, um, you know, who to see in situations like this, right? So second opinions, who do we go to? Who do we talk to? What are our resources? And how do we navigate this new norm for us? Because at this point, we didn't know like therapies, treatment, you know, what was going on in that initial diagnosis. So a lot of unknowns for us. No, I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, Dan, when you were talking about when you first heard lymphoma, you thought of your uncle. When you heard lung cancer, what did you think of? I thought about my kids, right? So when when cancer sometimes runs in your family, you, the mindset comes, is this something that I can pass on to my kids? Or, um, you know, is this genetic mutation something that uh, would also um, be related to like my brothers. I'm one of four. So do I need to have a conversation with them uh, that they have to get screened? Um, you know, what are my kids going to go through? Are we, you know, I brought kids into this world and uh, not knowing, um, you know, much about the cancer itself, you know, had I known before, would I still have brought kids into this world? Like those were some of the thoughts that went into my mind, went through my mind, and, um, you know, later on, as I'm starting to additionally digest some of the information, it's, well, how did I get lung cancer, right? Like, what, where did that come from? Um, so, all right, what have I done to expose myself to secondhand smoke or not being a smoker or have a history of smoking myself? You know, what environmental factors have I been exposed to? to where I'm susceptible at this point to lung cancer and just re couldn't really hang my hat on anything specific. And, you know, the doctors assured us that um, from what they can tell, it's not environmentally driven, but something, there's a switch in your body, something went off. We don't know what caused it, but we would say that it would not be environmental. So it was a little troublesome to kind of put myself uh, in the position of, um, you know, looking at, you know, how that affected my kids and my family. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, I'm so curious because uh, you were 34. Is that right? When you were diagnosed? Mm -hmm. I mean, no one expects, I was 30 or 31 when I was diagnosed. I mean, no one expects just to be diagnosed period when you're young with cancer, sure. but then lung cancer in particular, I think what I'm hearing from people is like, definitely you know, have not been hearing about that, you know, you don't hear as much about it, except for in certain contexts, right? I mean, was that what was going through your head too? Like, yeah, absolutely. And um, the more and more that we learn is crazy. The, the stories that we hear, the people that we follow, the people that we become connected with and friends with, you know, being diagnosed at such a young age and in uh, living a healthy lifestyle is completely difficult to fathom right? Just like ourselves, right? Like it just doesn't make sense at the end of the day to, to us. What was the treatment that you had to undergo? What were those first steps that you had to take? So um, we, the plan was to radiate the uh, largest mass in my chest. So at the base of my mediastinum where it splits off to either lung uh, or either side, um, that would provide relief. Um, largest cancer site, let's radiate it. Um, so went through five sessions, um, a Wednesday through Tuesday. So Saturday and Sunday off. Um, it wasn't too bad. I'm pretty resilient. So, you know, if I'm tired, I'm not necessarily realizing that I'm tired. I'm just pushing through things. Uh, probably a good quality, but at the same time, probably a bad quality where, you know, you have to listen to your body and understand what it's telling you at times. So, um, once radiation was done, we were starting a, um, first line treatment with a targeted therapy. Um, and the idea with the targeted therapy was, you know, hopefully a quality of life would go back to where it was before. And I'd be able to do the same things that I was doing with my kids and my wife and, you know, in my personal time that I was doing prior to cancer. So 
And uh, when I was reading through it, was it you did radiation and targeted therapy? And then did you do it again, radiation yes. and targeted therapy? So thankfully living in the Northeast, um, you know, having two great hospital systems um, in Philadelphia, there's more than just two, but I focus my care at two. Um, and then also partnering with some, with some uh, doctors in Boston, um, just continuously reviewed the plan, you know, best course of treatment. How do we continue to move forward and be as successful as possible? Um, navigating uh, my diagnosis. So the idea was to do some consolidative therapy. So some, uh, they were going to go to the right side of my lung, uh, top and lower lobes and radiate. And they were going to radiate those sites because they were not radiated before with the idea that if reoccurrence does occur, um, or progression does occur, it's going to most likely go back to those original cancer sites. And since it wasn't treated previously from uh, radiation, they wanted to go back and kind of just clean up those spots, make sure that there wasn't any residual cells there as well. Just to be as thorough as possible. I, I get exactly. it. And it sounds like you had a lot of specialists involved, but I'm, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about the targeted therapy, but of course, before you could even do that, it was the biomarker testing that allowed you to it was a targetable mutation, ALK positive. How important is that biomarker testing? I mean, did you even know that was happening? No idea. Like I said, you know, neither of us have a background in healthcare or um, in medicine. So, um, you know, just what you see sensationalized on TV, or if you have a family member or a friend that's going through something, that's that's your exposure to it. If it's not, you know, part of your expertise. So for us. Um, you know, like I said, thankfully we live in the Northeast and we have access to great healthcare systems. And, um, you know, that was the norm for them. We just said, Hey, something's not right. And they said, you know, we'll help you out. We'll take the reins from here and, and do what we were supposed to do. Right. Little did we know that meant, you know, biomarker testing and so on, but we're thankful that that was done and identified very early on hearing other people's stories. That's not always the case. So and, and I think I'd love to, you know, have you speak on that a little bit more because you went to these, uh, it sounds like, you know, maybe two major centers or academic centers, and they're more familiar with what to do. There are a lot of people treated in this country who don't have access to that kind of care. Um, what's your message there about the difference that testing has made for you? Because if you had known, of course, targeted therapy might not be on the table for you, right? Yeah. So you hear uh, nightmare stories where people just go straight to chemo. Um, you know, in certain cocktails of treatment options that are used in lung cancer can uh, be fatal for someone who is out positive. So right then and there, knowing that, um, you know, you're giving something to someone who, something to someone from a therapy standpoint that could actually kill them before it could even help them. You know, that, that is troublesome, but, um, you know, what I would tell someone is you just have to advocate for yourself we did early on not knowing what we were going into and what we were navigating at that point. Um, but it was very important for us to, um, you know, pull together doctors that um, would be in our corner and would fight for us. Right. And it wasn't about them. It was about, it was about us as patients. So um, we actually had not a great, um, experience with the hospital that I went into when I was first experiencing those symptoms that took me to the hospital. Um, you know, we left with the intention of never coming back to that, um, local hospital. So, um, was that just because of the way they treated you, you all or? Yeah. I mean, we had an oncologist come into the room the next day, uh, after I was put in a room or, um, admitted and just said, very vague information, didn't have much to give from an outlook standpoint or what was going on or what he had thought was going on. And, um, you know, when you go to the doctor and you break a bone, you're used to looking at an x-ray, right? So you're expecting, all right, we did a CT scan. We're going to show you the, the CT scan and we're going to show you what we're looking at and what's going on. Well, um, 
you know, he said, uh, I don't read pictures. And we were like, what do you mean? You're an oncologist. What, how do you not? Oh, well, you know, um, we have people that do that. It, I, I don't. And we just lost we lost a lot of um, hope right then and there for any proper um, guidance from mm -hmm. him as an oncologist, even though just there from a general standpoint, um, you know, we had asked them to leave and it was, it was a very difficult situation for us, but thankfully a interventional pulmonologist followed, followed up and came into the room afterwards a short period later and was able to explain some things to us as to what he was seeing. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and navigate those, uh, scans with us. So, um, you eventually you know, got that care. <laughs> yes. But it's so difficult when you, um, you know, when you're putting yourself out there and someone's telling you that they, what they do for a living really, you know, isn't going to help you in any way you get very turned off. So, you know, we Especially. left later, a few hours later, from that hospital with the intention of never coming back there. Yeah. So. Well, it sounds like you, you all, you know, stood up for yourselves and advocated and said, forget it, which I think is wonderful as a message to other people. Um, Dan, I really want to get into when you said there are the reasons why, which is, you know, your two daughters, um, well, you've three girls with your wife as well. Um, I know who really keep you going, but before we move there, the targeted therapy, do you mind sharing what they, they were, what they are and, how it's impacted your quality of life to not have to like go to the infusion center. You know. Yeah. So, um, I'm on a targeted therapy called electinib. Um, and I'm very fortunate, um, you know, to have that accessible to me and, and have insurance that, you know, does cover a large portion of the cost because it is very expensive. Um, but, um, I've, responded very well to it. Um, I have stable scans since uh, the spring of 2020. So very <laughs> relieved to kind of, um, you know, get that news every quarter and hopefully, you know, continue to get that news every quarter. I'm, not, I'm you know, knocking on wood right now. So um, it's allowed me to be a dad. It's allowed me to have manageable side effects. Um, fortunately for me, and now it reacts differently for everybody. And there's, there was times early on that were very difficult, um, to find balance, right. in what the medicine was doing to my body and how to react. And, um, just for me to find that comfort zone of taking it and what am I eating that's, you know, affecting my body and stuff like that. So, um, it, you know, it, it was tough, but we're in a much better spot now. Perfect. Oh yeah. So I just, you had mentioned side effects and I was wondering, you said you haven't had too many, um, but if you could just, what have the side effects been and how have you gotten past them? So the biggest one that I am um, challenged with now is uh, being out in the sun. So very susceptible to burn um, and being outside as frequently as I am. Um, you know, I don't like to be indoors at all. Right. I could never live in a big city because I would never see grass. Right. Like something so simple to me in my mind. Um, so to me, I've always got to be outside. So that's very difficult. Um, you know, high UV rays going to the beach. You know, I'm always wearing long sleeves. I'm always wearing a hat and trying to cover up um, because even early spring, 10 minutes out in the sun on a high UV ray day. Um, you know, I'm getting, uh, what feels like chemical burns on my hands, on my face, on my head. And, and it's, it's difficult. Um, but just, you know, Billy ribbon levels, right. Liver functionality. There's a number of different things, known side effects that come with, uh, with the therapy that I'm on. So it's all things that I've navigated, um, more earlier on than now, um, but continuously monitoring that through uh, blood tests every month and whatnot, so. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I do wanna get into, you know, when you're thinking about, well, first of all, with, with the White Ribbon Project, you know, when was your first time seeing, seeing the, the, the campaign and the pictures and what spoke to you about that? Um, my, 
so we're very active on social media. So my wife had, had seen something in December and had reached out to Heidi um, to get a ribbon to display. Um, I didn't really know much about it, um, but I've had numerous conversations with Heidi and um, you know what Heidi's visions are are amazing. But it's not to say that someone, um, you know, it can't mean something different to someone else, right? That's involved. And when someone goes and displays a ribbon, um, you know, if it's on their front door, it could be in support for someone else that's in their family or a friend. It may not be them, right? So however they're advocating or showing that they're, they're supporting uh, someone or the community, you know, can be different. So um, it, I'd, say, I'd say late December is when we received mm-hmm. our uh, our ribbons. We had received three and uh, I delivered two to uh, both health healthcare systems that I was receiving care at in Philadelphia. And then we kept one for us. So most of us had never really seen something for lung cancer, not not anywhere close to that kind of awareness. No. Yeah. And so I, I, what does it mean? Because people talk about it like, oh, it's a ribbon or but what does it mean to you and your family to have that? So to me, my thoughts are all inclusive, right? Um, everybody needs advocacy. Everybody needs a platform to, you know, push whatever cancer that they uh, would like to push, right? From uh, an awareness standpoint, it just so happens that, you know, I have lung cancer. So when I talk about cancer, it's probably going to be about lung and my experiences and the experiences of the individuals that we've come across since our journeys start, since our journey began. Um, it's, it's so important to tell your story, right? And, um, what that means for us is, you know, not just for us, it's for everybody. Talk about, um, we've said it several times during this conversation about your daughters, about your family. Um, What does it mean to share your story as a perspective, you know, um, from a father, from someone who just, I mean, every part of your story almost was something related to the girls or to thinking about them in their future. What has that been like? Um, It's been powerful. Um, it's definitely put things into perspective when it comes to life, right? So what to be upset about, what not to be upset about. Uh, it's okay to get upset still about little things, but um, at the end of the day, it's so important to cherish, uh, you know, that time that and experiences that you do have together. Um, you know, I found sharing my experiences um, or my story has paid off for other individuals to put things into perspective for them, whether they're going through something or not, you know, you can always take it, take something from an interaction of some with someone else. Right. And, um, apply that to your own life. And you mentioned, so I would love for you to talk about a specific way that you have, um, learned to manage living with cancer with your daughters. You said something about making sure it doesn't impact their daily lives, which I think is incredible. Yeah. So we're very honest. Um, very early on, we received some guidance to, to be honest with them. Um, you know, at that point they were, uh, four and two. So pretty extreme for them to, um, you know, to hear that daddy has cancer. They don't know what that means. Um, so to them, that's their new norm, right? dad going to appointments and whatnot. Um, But um, we've been honest and open and and talked to them, but we've also shared experiences where, you know, there's, um, you know, the dark side of cancer, but the the community part, and there's so many good things that come from sharing your story and putting yourself out there where other people rally around you within your, with what we call our village. Um, and feeling the love from that is, is pretty special being able to do things like this and talk with you, um, being able to, you know, go out and advocate, like, that's what I want my girls to see. Um, and the values for them to, to learn from, because I think that's really important and that'll help shape them in life. I think you're living proof for 
the fact that advanced stage lung cancer doesn't mean what it used to. I think people get a very sort of grim picture and it's not, you know, um, there's no cure yet, but can you talk about what it, what it is to live with stage four that, it, I mean, is it what you thought it would be when you first heard your diagnosis? You know, I thought quality of life was going to be very poor. And I thought the outlook was very poor. Um, but the further we get along um, or get through this journey, you know, that outlook continues to get pushed out, right, um, is my mindset. So uh, the further we get, the further that that outlook is going to exist. So um, is this where I thought I would be? No, I thought treatment was going to be different. Um, but, you know, continuing to advocate for us, you know, myself, my family, um, has always been my number one goal, um, and keeping things as normal as possible for, you know, my kids or, you know, being able to grow from these experiences, you know, was very important to us early on. So, um, I had forgotten to ask you too, just, I mean, your two daughters, what are their names again? How old are they? And what are their personalities like? So my oldest is very outgoing, um, you know, has to have social interaction in any given day or any given time. She's very much like me, always has something to say. Um, you know, then that's Frankie at, at seven years old. So it's, she's been talking as long as she could get a word out. She's been talking and she'll talk until she falls asleep every night. And, um, Georgia is very shy. Um, she just turned five and she likes to, um, you know, hide behind us and feel us as a sense of security. Um, but when she's out with, with friends and family and people that she's comfortable with, she's just as outgoing as Frankie is. So it's great to see her, um, you know, that, that side of her personality come out when she gets comfortable with people. Do you agree with Heidi's um, description that you're super dad? I mean, how... <laughs> How, how um, it sounds like you're very involved in their lives right i am uh i coach both of them their soccer teams you know i get to pick them i get to drop working from home right so a lot of bad things have come through the pandemic but one of the good things is i get to spend more time with my kids so um working from home but um you know being able to drop George off at school every morning, taking Frankie with me, coming home, putting Frankie on the bus, and then going and picking George up at the end of the day is, um, you know, I can't describe how important that is for me, um, just to have that interaction and talk to her about when I pick up Georgia, just talk to her about her day and, you know, see what she made her happy and see what made her upset that day, whatever it was, and just have that positive interaction with her is um, pretty special. And I think selfishly, you know, with my um, knowledge and um, experience with soccer, uh, being able to coach and um, share that interaction with them is pretty special for me as well. Is pickup drop off, does it mean something different to you now than it did before? Just even those small sort of interactions or were you always like that? You know, it's not a chore or anything like that. You know, being a dad is something that's very special for me. So I don't necessarily, I don't think I took it for granted. I think it just has more meaning now, being able to do those things.